Okay, so welcome back. Um, this is part three in our series on debunking the many, many computer myths that are out there uh, regarding personal computers and the technology surrounding them. In the first two videos in the series, we talked about power supplies. We talked about them in depth and hopefully presented a whole lot of information about how they work uh, to address some of the many myths about power supplies that seem to keep coming up on the internet with all the tech channels and all the uh, tech enthusiasts repeating stuff that's just not true. And hopefully we gave a lot of information to uh, shine some light on those. Um, we also, in those first two videos, talked about the basics of electricity, because really you can't understand computers and the myths surrounding them unless you understand the basics of electricity. So we talked about what is voltage, what is current, what is power, what is energy. So if you are fuzzy on any of those things and not really up to speed, I strongly suggest you take a look at those two videos. And I also recently posted another um, uh, video on the basics of electricity where we talk about some of the components like resistors and, and diodes and that kind of thing. So again, I suggest you take a look. In this video, part three, we're going to talk about some of the tools and techniques that you can use if you want to learn more about computers and how they work and maybe do your own debunking of some of the many myths. Um, what I found over many years of, of working in technology and dealing with some of the internet myths and the uh, tech enthusiasts, it, it seems like with 99% of tech enthusiasts on the internet, um, the vast majority don't really understand the basics. And they will say stuff and they will expect you to believe them. But when you ask them for actual data to support what they're saying, 99% of the time they have no data because they don't really understand it in any depth. They've heard it, you know, they heard it in a video, somebody said something and they, they took that little bit of information. They think that's the answer to all the world's questions. So part of the goal in this video is to encourage you to investigate for yourself. Now, again, None of these things I'm talking about, especially when working with hardware, are to encourage you if you're not qualified. Don't work with any of this electrical hardware if you're not qualified. Only if you're qualified um, should you be working on this. It can be very dangerous. So I'm encouraging you either to get qualified or to hire somebody who is qualified to do it. But the goal here is to try and encourage you to do your own research and get your own data to provide your own uh, knowledge on the subject and not just take people's word for it and, and wave your hands and you know, treat it like it's just one bit of entertainment and not really understand. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, a typical usage for this type of uh, analysis. Uh, in, the, in the first two episodes, we did a simulation of applying a short circuit and overload uh, to a real-world ATX power supply to see what happens and to try to bust the myth that, you know, if something, if something bad happens in your computer, your power supply, the power, power supply is going to blow up and everything's, you know, the house is going to burn down. Um, and to show that that's absolutely not true. In fact, there's a lot of protective elements inside your power supply that are designed to protect against that sort of thing. Uh, we did an actual simulation and I use this hardware and software technology we're going to talk about to generate actual data. Now, um, in an ideal world, you can you can show data like this to a, a an objective person and they will change their mind based on the actual data. Unfortunately, in the Internet world, people will stick to their beliefs you know, based on ego and you're not wanting to be proven wrong, um, they will stick to their beliefs and you can give them all kinds of data and they'll just ignore it uh, because honestly, uh, they believe what they want to believe and facts are totally irrelevant. But for the most part, if you personally want to learn this stuff, I strongly encourage you to con at least consider some of these technologies. And this uh, graph here is an example of how we actually put numbers to what happens to a, a fairly recently designed ATX power supply when you apply an overload and short circuit. And this is a plot obtained from that simulation 
Uh, on the x on the x axis, I've got from zero to thirty seconds, and I've got the amps flowing through the twelve volt circuit on the power supply. And you can see as I crank up the amps, it goes up ten, twelve, above twelve, up to thirteen, fourteen amps. And suddenly, the protective elements shut down the computer, and it goes off automatically to protect all the circuits. So this is actual data to support the belief that, yes, in fact, the power supply has protective elements to make sure bad things don't happen. So ideally, you could provide this as data if people would pay attention and listen to it, which unfortunately, often they don't. Here's another example where I did a um, about a 40-minute render, 3D render, using a high-power uh, GTX 1080 Ti graphics processing unit. And I actually measured um, the power usage. You can see up top here, this top graph is power consumption versus time. And you can see I've got watts uh, consumed by the G, uh, GTX 1080 Ti. And here is time in minutes. You can go, see I started about uh, six minutes and it goes up to about 46 minutes, rendering the entire 40 minutes. And you can see this was a um, GPU that's rated 250 watts, but in practice, uh, it is using only around 180 average. It's peaking up above 200. But this gives you a really good idea because these are actual numbers as opposed to people just saying stuff without any supporting data. And down here, I'm also monitoring the load in percent on that GPU. And you can see most of the time it is right at 100% utilization. So again, really good data to further your own understanding, even if people will ignore it. Now, what we're going to talk about in this first video is some hardware components. And I'm going to try and focus on some of the less expensive components that will give you uh, good functionality. Uh, as you may know, if you've ever looked at um, electronics components, measuring devices, they can get kind of expensive. So I'm going to try and focus on some of the lower priced but functional components that you might want to consider in doing your analyses. Um, we're going to talk about some of these devices here. You can see I've got on the on this far right, I've got a multimeter, which measures voltage and current and a bunch of things. On the far left, I've got what's called a lab jack, which is a brand of data acquisition device, which I've showed uh, how to use that in a number of my other videos. And we'll talk about it in a, in a little bit of detail here. Um, it's basically kind of like an oscilloscope. It allows you to to gather data from your circuits on these terminals and send that data over a USB. This is a USB connection into your computer. Uh, and you can take that data, real-time data being gathered by this device over the USB and you can do stuff with it. You can visualize it, you can graph it, you can analyze it. Um, again, these are fairly inexpensive devices. Um, again, less than $100 or maybe $100 or $200. Uh, here's another very inexpensive component that I use for measuring high currents because generally um, devices that measure high currents can be kind of expensive. So this is a device that converts high currents into low voltages that you can measure on your uh, multimeter and that kind of thing. Again, very inexpensive. Now. One other device that a lot of people use, but it gets up into the $400, $300 $400 range minimum, is what's called an oscilloscope. And this has a lot of huge benefits compared to these other devices in that it is very easy to use and it provides a graph. And you can see on the screen here, you can plot multiple signals in your circuits like voltages or digital uh, ones and zeros. Um, you can plot a lot of stuff and you can see it in real time where you can't do that with a with a multimeter. It just gives you a number, a readout, and it doesn't show you as time progresses what is happening to your voltage. Is it bouncing around? Like in this previous thing, you can see the the power consumption on this device is bouncing around and you wouldn't know that if you weren't looking at a uh, graph versus time. So this is very useful. It's easy to use. You just plug it in, you connect up to your circuit, and you've got your numbers. 
um, but it is more expensive. So it's got benefits, you know, as with anything, you, you pay more and you get more, okay? So based on what you really are probably going to need, the number one thing you're going to need probably is this multimeter on the right. And this one that I've got is about a $70 meter. It's extremely um, comprehensive. It's got a lot of functionality. It's, it's a professional device. And really, you're going to have to get a multimeter. If you're going to do any monitoring of um, circuit components and values, you're going to have to get a multimeter as a minimum. So we're talking about less than $100, usually around $70. Um, you can get Fluke. Uh, this is a Klein Tools. They're all very similar, but I would strongly suggest you consider that if you're, again, if you're qualified to work on electrical circuits and you want to um, step out and actually get some data rather than believe what you hear. So number one thing you're going to need. Um, another thing I would suggest you consider is something like this data acquisition unit, this lab jack. All right. It will give you some of the functionality of an oscilloscope, but it's not as easy to use and it's going to require that you have some other stuff like a computer and do some software. OK, so again, this all depends on what you're going to need, what you're going to be measuring. But this is just to give you some ideas of some of the devices out there. There's multimeters, there's data acquisition units that you can connect to a computer. There's conversion devices that convert signals from one format to the other to make it easier to read. Now, why do I say multimeter? Well, here is a list of some of the functions that you can get from this one device. It's only $70. You can measure circuit voltage, which you're going to be doing a lot. You can measure component resistance. So you can take a resistor and see what the value is. And again, if you don't know what a resistor is, I just posted the um, basics of electricity where I talk about resistors and how they're similar to a water valve and that kind of thing. It can also measure continuity. In other words, if you put your probes between two points in the electrical circuit, it can tell you if there is a continuous wire or a connection between those two points. Usually very beneficial to find out if something's open or closed or if there's a path between two points. And then it can measure capacitance, which you're going to probably need to do at some point. It can measure frequency of your alternating current or voltage. It can be very useful. It can measure current. In this case, you can see it can measure up to 10 amps of current. And if you get higher than that, you can use a device like this to, um, this goes up to 30 or 40 or 50 amps. You can convert that into a low level signal and measure it on your uh, multimeter using a voltage. And you can also surprisingly measure temperature. It comes with a temperature probe. And you can see over here, it's degrees or, far or centigrade, degrees Fahrenheit or centigrade, you can select. And it's basically a little probe, and you can touch the probe to the outer case of a component that's running hot, and you can measure degrees of degrees Fahrenheit or centigrade of that component. So if people say, you know, this component is going to be melting, well, you can measure it. You can get the actual numbers. Now, um, the oscilloscope is good and different from the multimeter in that it shows you real-time picture of those signals, all right? You may not be aware when you're using this multimeter, but these values, like voltage, may be changing with time, and you may not know it unless you actually look at it on this oscilloscope. And here's um, a, an oscilloscope. This is similar to the version I have, this Rigol oscilloscope. And you can see it can measure one, two, three, four values simultaneously and plot them on the screen. Really incredible. It's only $350 to $400 for this device. Really, really wonderful for measuring. Generally, it's for measuring voltages. And you can see here I'm measuring a square wave in the circuit. And it tells you the values and how what the frequency is and all that. So really very useful and different from a multimeter and different from a data acquisition unit, but has similar functionality. So again, um, very useful if you're going to need it, but you know, it depends on what you're going to use it for. 
Now, um, let's talk about this LabJack data acquisition. And this is just one version. There are other types out there. Let's talk about the pros of using something like this, okay? Again, this is just a box with a bunch of input and output terminals that you screw your wires into. And it feeds a USB cable that you plug into your computer and your computer can grab the data or send data out to these terminals uh, and use it for whatever you want to use it for. Now, the pros of this device, it's only around $160 for this particular device. They can be more expensive, but this device, the one I have called a U12, is only $160 versus about $400 for this oscilloscope, okay, or more. And that $400 is kind of the low end. You can get them up thousands of dollars. So um, it's less expensive, and it's got a lot of inputs versus the scope. The scope has one, two, three, four inputs. Some of them only have two inputs. So simultaneously with this lab jack, you can measure up to eight analog inputs compared to two or four with your oscilloscope. So those are some big benefits. Um, also, this device, since you're plugging it into the computer, it's pretty much focused around uh, computer analysis of this data, okay? This one is focused around you looking at a screen and looking at the data in real time. This is more focused around sending the data to the computer and then doing whatever you want with it. And you can do tons of things with the computer. Uh, tons of analysis. You can write software and do all kinds of stuff with the computer. Um, but it's um, basically they're, they're very different types of focuses for these two components. This U12 specifically has a lot of software from the manufacturer, including what's called a scope application, which does real time, which also does real time spectrum analysis. So you can see here this gray window. It can show you like if I have a sine wave coming into one of these inputs, it can show you in real time the sine wave, just like this oscilloscope can show you the sine wave in real time. And it has this, this um, software that comes with this U12 at the same time will analyze this and tell you what frequencies, okay? It's called spectrum analysis. And down on the bottom here, it says, Okay, it's got, this is a, you can see here, 0, 200, 400. This is a 100 hertz uh, sine wave. So it's got some functionality uh, right here. Unfortunately, it's not the greatest. So you, again, you get what you pay for. Uh, but it does, it is kind of focused on doing software with your computer. So this lab deck is ideal for writing your own software to analyze and display data. So Generally, it's for people who want to write software on the computer and grab data or send data out. Um, also, um, you're probably going to want to provide it a 5-volt DC source, so you're going to need to think about that. But again, it's really useful. And again, and it's um, like I mentioned where I did the analysis of overloading a power supply. I use this as a data acquisition device where I took this... Um, I took the voltages uh, from this device and fed it into the lab jack and then grabbed that from my computer and plotted this plotted this out, right? So I used this to develop this graph. So it can be very useful. Now the cons, what's the downside of using a lab jack? This is designed for reading very low level and low frequency sensor inputs, okay? These values are, are going to be, you know, limited to some hertz or maybe kilohertz and 10 volts input. So if you have like a uh, one megahertz signal, you're not going to see it on this. Whereas with an oscilloscope, you can get gigahertz, um, very high frequency signals. So again, you're limited to low voltages like 10 volts, uh, which is different from an oscilloscope where you can get many volts and low frequencies again so it's for low level low frequency sensor inputs all right um again it doesn't have a built-in signal generator which you may have to go buy a signal generator if you want to generate a signal for some reason um, it doesn't have one built in and again it re requires a computer you're going to plug this in via usb to a computer and it's really focused on having a computer 
Now, the downside of a oscilloscope, it can be expensive, as we talked about. You know, you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands. And again, often for these lower end, this is an entry level $400 uh, Rigel uh, uh, oscilloscope. Uh, often they don't have a built in signal generator either. So you may have to spend extra money, money if you want to generate some sort of signal to analyze. And then um, these oscilloscopes, while often they have from the manufacturer software and the ability to connect the oscilloscope to your computer, the process of connecting and, and analyzing the data from this can be complicated and frustrating. For example, this Rigel, you can connect to your computer via USB, and there's also a LAN connection on the back. And you can connect technically to your computer, and they do have some software and some drivers that allow you to connect. The question is, what do you do with it after you connect? And in many cases, um, it can be kind of frustrating to get everything working. And they're really not, I would say they're not really designed for software connection. I mean, you can do it. And there is some software that allows you to kind of reproduce this screen on your computer, kind of like you can with a lab jack. But again, um, you're going to, if you want to actually grab that data and use it and write software, you're going to have to learn how to do some programming. And you're going to have to do that. So yeah, you can do it, but just keep in mind, um, it, it can be complicated. The LabJack, I think, is, is a step ahead of that in, in the availability of software, although that too can be challenging. So if you're going to be writing uh, for these devices, you're going to be grabbing data. Uh, you're going to have to, to be doing some software uh, work, OK? So um, the other thing I talked about was just another example of how you can uh, monitor your circuits. Uh, it's, it's often difficult to get an oscilloscope that can measure like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 amps from your circuit, like you might see with a power supply. So what you can do is you can get a, this is a current sensor, which you can get off Amazon or wherever, for about $15 or $20. And basically you run your, your circuit through these two terminals. And in this case, you can run up to 20 amps, which is a lot of current, through these two terminals. And this has what's called a Hall effect sensor, this little device right here. And it basically measures the magnetic electromagnetic field from this current and converts it into a low level voltage output. In this case, it goes from 2.5 to 4.5 volts output as you go from zero to 20 amps input. So it's really nice because, you know, any device will, will measure, you know, your oscilloscope or your multimeter will measure two and a half to four and a half volts DC. So you can say, well, okay, if there's two and a half volts coming out of this, then I have no current. And if it's four and a half, I've got 20 amps. And if it's somewhere in between, I've got, um, you know, 10 amps or whatever it is. And um, so you can gather that with your lab jack, which is what I did. You can gather that voltage and you can plot it like we did to, to figure out the overload of the power supply. So very useful. And again, it's only 15 or $20 for this little device. And it um, is really useful in doing measurements. Now, the other thing I would encourage you to consider if you're going to do some analysis and debunking of myths, keep in mind, you can go to Amazon or eBay or, or wherever and you can get used equipment that is workable. It may not be the latest and the greatest, but it's got the components. And if you want to understand stuff, you can buy for really cheap, inexpensive, you can buy old equipment and you can play with it. And you can learn about it and you can look at the components, you can take it apart. And instead of just making believe you understand, you can actually look at the components and look them up online and see what the components are and see how they're wired. Um, maybe you can find some um, schematics online for these things. So again, think about getting used equipment and actually measuring it. Again, only do this if you are qualified. Don't do this if you're not qualified. But if you are qualified, you can do a lot with used equipment if you want to understand how stuff works. Now, another thing I encourage you to consider, um, 
we talked about in our power supply debunking, myth debunking videos, is getting a, a very inexpensive device like this. It's but again like twenty or thirty dollars. It's called a kilowatt, and it is a device that you plug in between whatever device you're going to be measuring. For example, your computer. So you take the wall plug from your computer, plug it into this socket right here, and then you plug this device into the wall outlet. And this thing is uh, in between the wall outlet and your computer, and it measures what's going from the wall out at, into your computer. And it can measure voltage at the computer. It can measure how much current is being drawn by your computer, your power supply. It can measure how much total watts are being driven or have, are being used by your computer how much energy is being used, the frequency of the currents and voltages. Absolutely wonderful device, very inexpensive. So if, if you have a question about how much power is your computer using, plug this in, look at it, and you can see right away. You know, what's the voltage, what's the current, what's the power? Um, it is amazing to me how few people are willing to spend 20 or $30 and instead will make up this stuff about, you know, my computer's using 1200 watts of power and that's based on something somebody heard somebody else say in some forum, and they have no clue what they're talking about. So, you know, get a little device, plug it in. You don't need to be qualified to do this. You know, just plug this in, plug it into the wall, turn it on, and you've got the numbers. So, again, I encourage you to spend a little time and a little energy to actually learn stuff and get actual data, okay? Um, now, if you're going to be doing any type of lab testing, I encourage you to, to spend a few dollars on some of these accessories. Now, the first thing I encourage you to do when you are doing lab testing is modularize stuff. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say I want to have an on-off switch for a power component. And in this case, I had an on-off switch to apply a load to my power supply when I did the overload. So I went to Lowe's or Home Depot or some... Um, electrical supply store and got a regular wall switch. And you can see I've got an on off switch here and you can't see underneath, but it's got an electrical plastic electrical box cost a dollar or two. And I hooked that up and I ran a couple wires and I connected to what are called spade lugs. I just crimped them. I you basically squeeze them on the end of the wire. And these are the, what the terminal lugs look like. And again, they cost a couple bucks to get these. And I modularize this switch. So now all I have to do is unscrew these wires and I can take this um, switch ready to connect anywhere. All I have to do is screw it in and I'm ready to go. And it's safe. It's covered. I've got a box covering it underneath. And it's, it's so much easier for the next time you want to do a test. This is all modular. You just unscrew it, bring it over, you know, get a terminal block like this with screw terminals screw it in and connect it to whatever you want to connect it to, and you can do a test on something else. So again, I encourage you modularize. Take your components, uh, get some wire like this, cut some jumpers, put some lugs on them, get some, get a terminal block for a few bucks. And you know, if you've got a switch or you've got a resistor or you've got uh, whatever you're going to use as a component in your circuit, make a modular component out of it that you can just take around and screw it in and use it, okay? Strongly recommend that if you're going to do some tests. It's safer and it's a lot easier. So next time you want to you want to learn something, you're not going to say, oh, it's too difficult to go and take out the wiring and blah, 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 and hook it all together. Here, you just, it's all ready to go. You just screw it in and you're done. Now, I also encourage you to look at something like a breadboard. This is for low signal level stuff, like logic stuff, but you can get a bigger, a bigger version. And so really what you do is you take your components and here's some resistors and a jumper wire, and you can put them and make up a test circuit and wire stuff together and try it out. So again, a couple bucks for this, you get some components, you get a breadboard, this is called a breadboard and you get some jumpers and you plug it in and you can hook up any circuit you want and just try it out and you it's easy to measure you can connect your measuring wires across the resistor or on any of these plugs and you're ready to go it makes it so much easier if you if you want to test out some circuits now down here is 
what's called a wire cutter or a wire crimper. And again, I suggest if you're gonna do any testing work or wiring, you're gonna be cutting wires, you're gonna be cutting off the ends to expose the, um, the wire so you can plug it into these um, spade lugs. You need to get something like this. There's, you know, 10 bucks maybe if you go to the store. Uh, very, very useful, a, a wire crimper and wire um, cutter. Now, the other thing, if you're going to be soldering, you need to get a good soldering iron set. And again, not very expensive. This is a Weller. Uh, Weller is a huge name in soldering irons. Um, learn how to do it. There's on the web, there is tons of videos on how to do soldering irons, uh, what to get. There's um, lots of different evaluations of different soldering irons. But if you, I strongly suggest it's a very useful skill to learn and it will help you if you're going to build uh, demo circuits and you're going to test them. Okay, so I strongly encourage you to get some of these low, low priced accessories. Um, build a bunch of, you know, take some components, modularize them so that they're easy to use next time and you're off and running. Now, suppliers for this stuff, of course, Amazon has got everything. Um, check on Amazon, you'll probably find it. There is another uh, man, a vendor, online vendor, that is kind of, I view it as kind of the replacement of the old Radio Shack, which used to be the hobbyist uh, technology store. Now SparkFun is, is the one, and they've got tons of little kits for these types of devices, breadboards and um, connectors and stuff. And they've also got components, and they've got um, like uh, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, the really wonderful uh, source of technology is SparkFun. Check it on the internet, you'll find it. A, a lot of low-priced um, technology. And then I mentioned LabJack. Uh, LabJack is good if you want a low frequency, low level data acquisition unit. Um, I, I like LabJack to an extent. They've got some nice uh, low price devices. I wish they would have better software. The problem with LabJack is you're kind of on your own. You're going to need to be able to write software. They do have some software. Um, with the, the device I've got, the U12, they've got a lot. With the, some of the newer, it seems like they have less software. I haven't really investigated, but you know, consider you're gonna have to write your own software to grab data, which is kind of annoying. Um, and again, it's very low level, low frequency stuff that you're gonna be gathering. It, it's a very specific purpose for, for sensors. So uh, it's good um, if you can use it. Um, so just keep that in mind. As far as oscilloscopes, if you're going to get an oscilloscope, um, some of the big names are Rigol. I've got a Rigol, very nice. Uh, low price, this is kind of the entry level scopes, Rigol, Siglent. There's a few others out there. Um, these are some big names you might want to consider. Um, tons of reviews and evaluations online of different entry level scopes. So here's an example how I use these hardware devices uh, together with some software. And in the next video, we'll talk about some software and how to uh, connect to these devices and some of the different software you can use in evaluations. There's a ton of it. Um, here's what I did when I was measuring my overload. And I've got here my 12 volt DC coming out of my power supply. And I ran it through a, a rheostat, which is zero to five ohm variable resistor. And I ran that current through this device, which converts big currents into small DC voltages, and then to the negative of the DC going back to the power supply. So very simple circuit. And out of this, I get, again, we said two and a half to four and a half volts DC as you go from zero to 20 amps primary. And that, since it's low level, it's below 10 volts, I can feed that into one input on my lab jack and grab that data over this USB connector going into my computer. And they've got a software, which we'll talk about, which is called LG Stream. And it automatically grabs that data from the lab jack. And you can see down here, you can write it to a file and you can save that into a, called a CSV file. And it will give every point in time what the value is. So you can have thousands of points uh, over you know 10 or 15 seconds and you can 
put that into a file. And then what I did is I just dragged and dropped that CSV file into Excel and plotted it out in Excel. So really fairly simple if you got the right devices. Um, so again, I would encourage you, if you want real data, this is a really good way to go. Um, if you, again, if you are qualified to do work with these voltages and currents. Um, but again, I would strongly encourage you to go for the actual data. So anyway, I hope this helps. Uh, next video, we're going to get into the software side of this and see what's available. There's a lot of really good stuff. And um, hopefully that will help you out to uh, do some, some more learning in this uh, field. So hope that helps. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.